Hello, everybody. We're back for uh, this last uh, half day about uh, APIs uh, at the APIs interface uh, to talk about a really important topic that really changed the industry over the last six, seven years, which are API specification. The way to describe APIs in a machine readable way that enable a lot of automation and a, a huge ecosystem of, uh, uh, um, of a software that is able to read these machine readable uh, definitions to generate design, testing, documentation, and many uh, security, sometimes uh, API management um, uh, options. Uh, right, so we will talk about uh, these topics. And I I'm glad to introduce our first speaker, uh, Darren Miller, who is a board member of the Open API Initiative that now managing uh, the evolution of the spec. Hello, Darren, how are you? Hey, Mehdi, I'm here? doing good. Perfect, so if you are able to find the sharing screen button, uh, we would be able to hear uh, your talk about the state of the Open API initiative and also introducing Open API specification 3.1, brand new one. I thought I already did click the sharing screen button. Hold on, let me hunt. We should, you have, give... a, we should have a waiting music like. <laughs> and this is how long it takes the presenter to find where the share screen button is. And no, it's, like, uh, it's like plugging uh, the connector to the computer in a physical conference. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, 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 so you want to give me a clue as to whereabouts on the screen it is? Yeah, it should be just below our photos. We have uh, four buttons. Yes. And the third one is a screen, actually. It doesn't look like <sighs> There you go. Look at that. Yeah. Hello. Okay, and now I am sharing my screen and yeah, my this video. Is event. This is a remote event. This Perfect, this. thank you, Carol. You have 25 minutes. Enjoy your time on stage. Awesome, thanks, Maddie. So we're going to talk about the Open API specification and the Open API initiative, its past, its present, and its future. So. The Open API Initiative has become the most successful industry organization in the API space. Our members range from the biggest companies in the world to startups with big ideas. Uh, if we actually get more members, the icons on this slide are going to end up getting too small to actually read. Fortunately, we have one more space on the bottom row to add the logo for our latest member, which is Postman. And Postman are going all in on Open API as their API is their official API description format, and we're really excited to have them officially join the Open API initiative. The Open API specification has proven it's not just a passing fad technology. Open API became hugely popular with its 2.0 release back in 2014 when it was still named Swagger. Uh, in 2017, we released a major update with uh, version 3.0. And since that time, we've released several minor patches, just making corrections to language and just clarifying certain things. And we've worked on some new work, uh, like alternative schemas, which is currently being piloted with implementations just to make sure that we get it right before we actually include it into the official specification. And in parallel to that, we have been working on uh, version 3.1, which is our latest update. And yes, it is almost here. Uh, we have an RC0 release at the moment. Now, this particular update to the spec, it isn't going to feel like a big change, but there was a lot of hard work done between our community and the JSON schema community in order to solve some significant challenges that our users are facing when trying to build effective API management processes. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is new in Open API 3.1. And it's mostly minor stuff, but I'm going to save some good stuff in for the uh, for the end. Let's we'll start with the info object. It's where you describe about your API, just give it some kind of tech contextual information. And we've had feedback from the community that a lot of uh, objects on uh, in an open API description have a summary and description. We had a description. And there was a request to also add summary. So we already have title. So think of sort of summary as the subtitle. 
Titles really short, summaries a little bit longer, but just plain old text. And then we have the description that allows you to do a markdown type of content. Another piece that was changed in the info object is adding an identifier to the license. We used to just allow you to give a URL so that somebody could click on that URL and go and find out about the license that your API is permissioned with. Uh, but that wasn't great for machine readable scenarios. So we have introduced uh, an identifier property, which uses the SPDX identifier for machine processing. And if you follow that link uh, at the bottom, you'll see there are a thousand and one different licenses for every single possible scenario you could possibly think of. So they're just a couple of little things that are added into the info object. Something that is a lot bigger and more significant is a new top level element that we have added called webhooks. Now, webhooks really are just another way of doing callbacks. Again, this was a community contribution, and uh, the, the feel was that callbacks are fine. Callbacks are where you have some kind of operation, and you can go and register to receive a callback at some later point in time. But some scenarios, exist where there is no API for actually registering for the webhook. It's actually done in an out-of-band context. So webhooks allow this out-of-band. It's a new top-level object. And within it, you can basically specify a path item, just like you do with a callback. And we got to the situation it's like, well, it's kind of nice to have all of these things at a top level, because that's great for documentation to see all of the callbacks. But then maybe there is also a place where you can register them. So we said, well, if you want to have it there twice, we don't want folks to have to be able to specify it twice. So we introduced path items as a new component section so that you can define reusable path items and then just reference that path item from either the webhook or in the callback where the uh, subscription endpoint is. And you'll notice in this little fragment of Open API, we don't actually have a paths property at the top level. That used to be a required property. And we've intentionally removed that property uh, from being required. Uh, and this makes it easier to define well defined Open API descriptions that are just reusable libraries. So if you have a set of components that you want to define, that you're going to reuse across a set of different APIs, you can define a well-defined document that won't give you any errors, and you don't have to put an empty paths in there where everybody looks and goes, why are there no paths in this object? It's like you don't have to include the object at all. So moving on, references. This is going to be a popular uh, concept. If you notice up here, Next to the dollar ref, we actually have a summary and a description. And there's a reason why we've added it here. Uh, we'll talk more in a minute about JSON schema and the changes that we're making about adopting new capabilities that are available in JSON schema. And one of the things you can do in JSON schema is there's a certain set of properties that are considered annotations, but not constraints, that you can sit alongside uh, dollar refs within a JSON schema. And so in order to match that capability, we've started to allow some properties to sit alongside the $ref. So if you are reusing some component, but you want to add some additional descriptive content to say this thing that we're reusing means this within this particular context, uh, then you can now add summary and description. And we're still open to the idea of adding potentially some other properties that can sit alongside dollar ref. We have provided guidance that says anything that you provide at that top level should override, i.e. completely replace whatever is defined within the thing that you reference. But we didn't put it a must. We, may, we recognize that there's maybe some tooling scenarios where somebody might actually want to present both pieces of information, aggregate both the reference description and the top level description. We'll leave that in the hands of the capable tooling people. And 
Another top level entity that, or another significant entity that we have enhanced is around the area of security. And we have a lot of other work going on with regards to security. We're just not quite ready to embed it in the spec, but these are a couple of easy items that we figured we could get into a minor release. One of the things that we've added is a new type of security scheme called Mutual TLS. So if you use client certificates in order to ensure that you're getting an authenticated connection, you can specify the type Mutual TLS. And of course, as is all with security schemes, you can combine different security schemes. So you can say it's Mutual TLS and it requires an auth key or it requires some other kind of scheme. And we've gone a little step further in that if you, in the past, you used an OAuth protocol for a security scheme, we allowed you in the requirements object to provide an array of scopes. That a limp said, you can access this particular operation if you have had the application is consented to these particular scopes. But we didn't allow you to use those con that concept unless you are using OAuth or OAuth2. Uh, so we have now extended that. And so now you can create an array of strings underneath the security requirement. In this case, I've mentioned called client certificate as a security scheme. I've said you need the to do dot write either role or claim or whatever your security scheme calls those things in order to be able to access that particular uh, operation. And there are a whole set of other smaller items, clarifications, debatably, you might call them enhancements, things like allowing request body for all HTTP methods. In the past, we explicitly said, no, if it's a get, you can't pass a request body. Um, in some ways, we're becoming less and less opinionated as to how uh, you should build your HTTP API. It's not recommended to send bodies along with, po with get methods and delete methods, but we recognize that there are some folks that do do that, and we don't want them to be able to stop describe, being able to describe their particular API. We had a little boo-boo in the encoding object, and the encoding object is kind of this funky thing that allows you to use specify further serialization information on top of a JSON schema that is being used to describe form data. Um, kind of have a hoping that that may be able to go away with some of the new stuff that's coming in JSON schema. But uh, for those people who really need to describe URL encoded forms or multi-part form data, we'd forgotten to say multi-part form data was okay. So we've added that back in. So if you are if you are a big user of form data, you'll appreciate that extra wording in the spec there. Uh, we closed some gaps. We had an issue with path path item parameters where we didn't actually say you actually have to define those path item parameters and not just kind of leave them hanging. Uh, so we've closed some loops there. And we've removed some definitions of some formats. Uh, we had that have the notion of types and formats that we borrowed from JSON schema. And uh, we were explicitly saying, well, byte and binary format mean this explicit thing. We've taken those out because as we'll discuss in a minute, we are deferring more and more of these kind of modeling things, specifically to JSON schema. And we're staying out of the way of having opinions in that area. Now, which kind of brings us to the conversation around versioning. And when we introduced version three of the spec, we knew that we needed to do a better job of, of communicating to people, okay, this is what it means when we introduce a major version. This is what it means when we introduce a minor version of the spec. This is what a patch version means. And we followed that uh, in the last version using Sember, but it, continues to cause us challenges. And uh, because a spec isn't like a deployed piece of tooling, it doesn't have the same characteristics. And a change that might be considered breaking to one set of tooling may have absolutely no impact on another set of tooling. And we attempted in 3.03 .03 to actually add some wording that would make it very clear that if you bumped a spec up 
to a new minor version that you could take an existing open API description that you had written, just change the version and it would be still valid in tooling. And that is something that we still want to encourage because we understand that companies are creating large number of docs. And if we say, oh, in order to bump this up to this new version to be able to use a new feature, you're going to cause a whole bunch of other things to all of a sudden not validate properly. That becomes a maintenance headache. So that is still a key part of our guidance is that minor versions shouldn't require you to go and start changing your, uh, updating your descriptions. They should be forward compatible. The problem when we ran into 3.1, we ran into some additional issues, especially around the work we were doing around JSON schema that were in very, very specific scenarios for what we perceived would be very small number of customers and literally so small, we haven't actually found tooling yet that exists that would break the scenario. We said, yes, in theory, it could be breaking, but in reality, it isn't. So. We had a large debate about whether to move to 3.1 or to move to 4, and we didn't feel that version 4 accurately reflected the set of changes that were going into this version of the spec. And so we made a decision, and it wasn't supported by everybody. We literally had to take a vote. Um, and some people are going to be upset, and some people are going to be happy, but we made a decision to move forward and actually ship something, because that is what is important. Um, the 3.1 will ha has some scenarios that might, in strange, obscure scenarios, cause somebody to break. Um, the important thing from our perspective is minor means it's not significant changes. Major means that we are making significant changes. And we're going to do our best moving forward to clarify the impact of the changes that we are making in the spec. But you can look at major and minor and use native language to mean that. Don't go back to this Ember spec because we aren't, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Precisely following Semver for this specification. So I've talked a little bit, a lot. I mentioned, hinted about JSON schema. What are we trying to do with JSON schema? So the idea here is that in the past, we had OpenAPI 3 as a description. We had this concept called OpenAPI schema within it which was almost exactly the same as JSON schema draft four. We had a few minor differences. And that wasn't a problem if you were using open API tools that had internally built schema tools that understood the specific differences of open API schema. But as soon as you try to use standard JSON schema tools, which a lot of people were trying to do, it didn't always work. And you'd get false positives on failures. And it was just a problem. And the community spoke loud and clear. They want us to just A, support later versions of JSON schema, and they want us to be completely compatible. And so moving forward in 3.1, we don't have other than as a name, a definition of open API schema. We literally just say this open API schema is JSON schema draft 2019-09 or later. And the folks who are building tools, open API tools, they will defer to JSON schema tools. I mean, they have a choice. They could embed their entire own version of a JSON schema parser inside their open API tools, but it's more likely that open API tooling will just take a dependency on JSON schema tooling to actually do all of the work around JSON schema. And so that means we do not have any more weird open API specification exceptions around Oh well, you can you can't have an array for a type, and read only works differently in this case, and write only works differently. We don't have you don't need to use nullable. You can use the JSON schema concepts for this, and we just defer to uh, JSON schema when it comes to formats. It means we can start using concepts like ID at a JSON schema, so that you can have a path independent way of referring to other schemas so that you can move things around on your file system and they don't necessarily break. 
And as I mentioned about encoding, JSON schema now has this content media typing, content media type and content encoding to help describe serialization information that we will start to have, our users will now be able to leverage and maybe in the future and maybe in version four, we can get rid of that encoding object because it's really out of scope for, for what open API really should be trying to do. So looking forward to the future, uh, we have a whole bunch of things that is on our backlog of stuff to work on. Uh, we have overlays, which is a concept that we have spent quite a lot of time looking into when we have a proposal uh, on how we might do this. And this is the idea of having a separate document, and we probably will uh, release it in a separate spec that allows you to apply a set of changes on top of an API description. And there's a whole set of really interesting scenarios uh, that will make that will be lit up by having this notion of overlays. Reusable groups, uh, being able to dollar ref to only one thing is kind of a pain when you have a bunch of parameters that are used on every single operation and we really wanna find a solution to that. That's high on our list of priorities. I mentioned before about alternative schemas, the spec is nailed, uh, is, is down in our proposals uh, section of the uh, GitHub repo and we're looking for more community feedback from people who are actually building tools to say, yes, is, this is the right design before we bake it into the spec. Uh, we continue to have feedback about paths, optional paths, multi-segment paths. We have folks who want to be able to distinguish operations based on query parameters. As I mentioned, in, from a security perspective, digital signatures encryption is a big topic uh, that we are working towards enhancing uh, OAS to be able to say, yes, this particular operation requires a payload and you need to sign that payload or you need to encrypt that payload with this set of security parameters. And we have other areas around discovering security credentials to make it easier for tooling to figure out how to get that token in order to be able to call your API, in order to make those kind of try it experiences much, much easier. You'll find a lot of this information in the repo uh, on GitHub, OAI, Open API Specification. And more specifically, uh, we do do a lot of discussion in issues. Uh, we just find that as an idea starts to coalesce, uh, issues tend to get fragmented and very, very long and difficult for people to read. So we've moved to a process that we, we borrowed from the Swift language, uh, which is this notion of proposals. And so here we have these very specific documents with the template that describes the scenarios of the problem that we're trying to solve, the potential solution, and we use these as working documents in order to find a solution that is gonna work and we can move it quickly into the actual specification. And our plan is hopefully uh, to very quickly, once we get the overlays work done, start working on an Open API 3.2. Uh, speaking of uh, having conversations about API specifications, uh, this is just a little shout out to the API specifications conference that is happening in September. I expect to see a lot of the folks that I'm seeing speaking here and attending here uh, will hopefully be joining us in the API specifications conference. Our call for papers is out at the moment. You can go to apispecs.io there. And this event is really intended to provide a forum for people who are either using specifications and have feedback or writing API specifications uh, to be able to network and share their ideas is and learn from each other. So please, if you have some ideas you want to share, uh, submit for the call for papers. And with that, uh, there's a couple of minutes left. I want to open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, yeah, one minute and a half for questions. Uh, we have questions like, does JSON schema work on things other than JSON? If not, any plans to help describe representation that are in JSON in open API specifications? Absolutely, and this is what alternative schemas proposal is. It is an idea to be able to point to any other kind of schema type, whether it's XSD, whether it's a protobuf schema, and uh, that's exactly what uh, that alternative schema is designed to enable. So go over to the GitHub repo, go take a look at that alternative schemas proposal. Yeah, 
uh, also one question uh, uh, is about uh, other specifications. So at the EPI specific specification conference, you work with all other specs, right? Open API initiative is not just about open API specs, right? I, I, absolutely not. We can all learn from each other. And this is our real intention. Uh, last year, we had representatives from uh, JSON API, OData, GraphQL, um, I'm going to end up forgetting a bunch of specs here, but uh, a wide range of people who are just interested in this idea of being able to have machine processable documentation contracts that can help to enable tooling and make the API lifecycle just that much easier. Uh, whatever we can do to be able to share ideas and have consistency. Well, we had Fran, of course, from Async API. Uh, this is just a great example of two groups working together and sharing concepts and not introducing more stuff that users have to learn when we are able to share things. Perfect. So we see you in uh, around one hour uh, for a panel about API specification. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, uh, looking you, forward to it. You can uh, unlink your screen from the screen share and see okay. you in an hour. And now we receive, uh, to continue on API specifications, uh, another a really well adopted specification uh, for event driven APIs, especially designed for, is uh, the async API. And we're really glad to have the creator and author of the async API specification, Fran Mendes, who will be joining us as the next speaker uh, to tell us the story about um, designing event driven architecture using the async API specification, right? So, simple title for something that looks straightforward. Hello, Fran, how are you? Hey, Mehdi. Thanks. Thanks for yeah. inviting and this awesome introduction. <laughs> no, no, totally. We're really glad to, to have you. So, uh, yeah, uh, puzzle of the day. Are you able to share your screen and find? Yeah, the, let me try. I actually I haven't tried yet. Um, it's so the third button. Let me you check. Check. <laughs> uh, OK, so I see where it is. OK. Two, maybe. Okay. Yes, will be seeing my that screen works. maybe now. That works perfect. We see a lot. That works. Some, uh, perfect. Some. Uh, I hope this ID is. and text editors. Perfect. So, Fran, <laughs> your sound is great. Your screen is there. Go full screen, and uh, yeah, the stage is yours for twenty-five minutes. Thank you. Thanks, man. So, um, yeah, just one thing. I'm not gonna be uh, going full screen. Uh, in this case, because then, uh, you know, in my setup, this will, will be ruined. So, so yeah, I think we can, uh, we can stay like this. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, uh, thanks for, for the invitation and, um, I hope, um, uh, you folks can, uh, uh, will be happy with my talk today here and, uh, and can learn something new and, um, and yeah, and then we can share here. So. Let me speak a little bit about uh, what is in KPI, who I am, uh, and uh, so as as Medi was saying, so I am the creator of the Async KPI specification. Um, it all it all started like as a side project, uh, like uh, usually it happens, right? And um, and yeah, so so far during the last years, I've been dedicated to uh, just making Async KPI uh, grow because. There was a there was a need, right? It, it it couldn't be a side project anymore. So, uh, so yeah. Um, so my name is is Fran Mendes. Uh, I used to live in Barcelona, in Spain. Now I'm back to my hometown, Badajoz. Uh, so happy to share uh, time with you if you are in the south of Spain or uh, Portugal as well. So I'm close to Portugal, so happy to share some time whenever COVID nineteen uh, permits. So so yeah. Um, let me go straight because we don't have uh, so much time uh, today here. Um, I would like to uh, explain a little bit what's the what's the specification for. Um, Async API was conceived as a way to um, to define event driven systems. And what's event driven systems, uh, or what's event driven architectures, or event driven APIs? Call it whatever you want. And then replace event driven with message driven message based event based. We have a myriad of terms for this almost almost the same thing, right? So, uh, so yeah. So 
the idea is we have sometimes systems that are exchanging messages and uh, and this exchange of messages are triggering behaviors on the other side or in both sides or in multiple sides like like it's the case of event driven architectures so think about it uh, for a moment as a as a WebSocket connection, for instance, uh, you have the client, you have the server, and uh, then just send a message, and you might get a response. I don't like to say response because it might not be a response. It might be another, just another message from the server back to the client. So uh, in, in in this case, what we have is effectively an API. It's just. It's just we are not uh, using HTTP. We're not using request response pattern, but it's effectively an API because um, uh, by, the, by the definition of API, right? Application programming interface, uh, it, is, it is strictly an, an API, right? So I try to, in the beginning, I try to define this kind of APIs with open API. I even, I asked for that uh, in an issue, uh, must be somewhere, <laughs> I don't remember now. And um, and uh, yeah, the open API falls correctly and uh, as it's normal, say like that's not part of the of the target of open API and that's too much maybe. Um, so yeah, they, they didn't, they decided not to go into that land and I understand but I still had a need. So first, uh, what I what I tried was uh, to hack OpenAPI. Uh, it did the trick for uh, for documentation because I was using get. Uh, I, I was using a convention like okay, so get is subscribe and post is publish. So it means that whenever you see post, is a message is being sent, and whenever you see get, uh, a message is being received or can be received, right? It's a hack. So, <laughs> as as all the hacks, uh, the, the has a, have a short life. And um, when when I entered the the code generation side of things, it was like not really. It doesn't fit. Um, so yeah, like th this is this is the, the more or less the the, the history and, and 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 the history and why the purpose of this is this specification, right? The isn't KPI specification. So uh, my initial purpose with async API was to have event-driven microservices defined. Uh, then Internet of Things APIs appeared. Uh, you know, like uh, everything is booming around the IoT. So it was unexpected to me, uh, to be honest. Like I wasn't thinking about it at all. And uh, and then you have streaming APIs. And when I say streaming APIs, HTTP streaming APIs, uh, like servers and events and 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 other technologies, right? So, um, so yeah, anything that's uh, an exchange of messages uh, can can actually be defined with async API, and it's the the target or the, the purpose of uh, of the async API specification. One of the main differences that we uh, one of the differences that we had to add uh, in respect to um, uh, to Open API is the concept of the protocol. Right, it was like, uh, yeah, now it's not HTTP anymore. Uh, in the beginning, it was just uh, to me for what it, it was just about AMQP and MQTT. But yeah, more people start to contribute, and it's like, uh, no, we also need Kafka. You have to consider it. No, WebSocket. No, NATS, Stomp. HTTP. I mean, everything you see there, right on the on the on the slides, um, and they were right. And there are, there are many more that are not even listed here. And eventually, what happened is we need HTTP as well. So it's like, oh, that's a lot. Okay, so uh, we decided to include it. Um, the thing with the, the with the with the protocols is, and something that I would always like to remark about it is, the specification allows you to specify the protocol that you want to use, but there is not there is not a set of uh, protocols that you can use or protocols you cannot use. It's a free form text field. You can put whatever you want there. Uh, it's just up to the tooling to uh, understand these protocols and do something with them. Uh, if there's no tooling, you probably don't have uh, 
it, it will probably have not have much value, right? But the thing, the the, the thing with this is, um, we're not restricting. We're not restricting restricting to uh, to any specific set of uh, of protocols, and that uh, makes it more flexible, but at the same time more complicated uh, to maintain because different protocols have different. Uh, needs and, and different ways of thinking about messaging. Uh, like it's the case, for instance, for Kafka, some people say it's a database, it's a, it's a, can be seen as a database. Uh, some, I don't know, like for instance, MQP is a completely decentralized model for brokers. Uh, and, and then you have WebSockets, which is client uh, server. It's not request response, but the model, it's not that it's client server, but it's usually uh, use in this context uh, on the client server model, right? So that changes a lot because that means there's no broker or anything, right, in the middle. So um, yeah, I would like to to uh, to show an, an example uh, because I think that's uh, the best way to understand these things. Let me make it a little bit bigger, maybe. I think that's enough, maybe. Um, so yeah, so here we have an async API uh, file that demonstrates the, the usage of, uh, or the definition of an account service, microservice, or call it whatever you want. Um, this service is just going to be processing signups, user signups. And what it's gonna do is, um, at some point when the service uh, processes sign up and store the user in the database and do all the things that have to do. It's going to push a message to the broker. And uh, so people can actually, um, so people can actually consume it, right? So people can receive this message. So this is what the, this async API file is, is saying. We have channels and, uh, and we have a, a channel called user slash signed up. For those familiar with HTTP, which is almost everyone, uh, this looks like a path and it's intentional. Um, that also, this also looks like a uh, like an MQTT topic, which also uses slashes, right? And uh, this is saying that you, as a consumer, can subscribe to this topic to receive this message that is defined here. If you're familiar with Swagger, with OpenAPI, uh, and probably also with Raml, uh, I'm sure you already noticed there is some similarity with OpenAPI. And that was done on purpose, so that things are somehow reusable at, uh, when it's possible or when it is at least easy to, uh, to do, right? So um, aligned a little bit with what Daryl was saying, about uh, OpenAPI 3.1. Uh, congratulations, by the way, to the OpenAPI folks. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy that you're adopting the new uh, JSON schema uh, version. So aligned to, with this, we, we did the same on async API 2 back in September, and uh, because we knew that this was going to happen eventually. And this definition of a payload or, or schemas that you can define on, 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 um, on an async API file, are actually using the JSON schema uh, draft seven. Um, the version that OpenAPI 3.1 is using is the next one. Uh, I always forget, I think it's 2019, like September 2019. Um, I think let's call it uh, draft 08, uh, even though some people will not love it. But um, we stick to, we stick to, to seven because we're basically waiting for the tooling for uh, draft eight to uh, to be uh, not even mature, to be pr present, basically. So that there's not much uh, tooling around uh, the latest draft. So once this is done, we, we will update, and it will be exactly the same type of schema definitions as OpenAPI 3, uh, 3.1, right? So that said, uh, as you can see, we have an, an async API file on the, on the left side. Um, and on the right side, what we have is uh, the documentation render explaining that you can subscribe to this topic. And this is the payload of the message that you're going to receive. 
you know, all this, all of this might resemble to Swagger UI or to uh, Redoc uh, and you know all these uh, documentation generators for for Open API. Um, so the cool thing about this, uh, as, as I was saying, is you can now come here and say, okay, so I'm gonna add a new server, and this is gonna be a production server. That's the the name of the server that I'm just inventing right now, and uh, and the server is gonna be using MQTT. So this is my production broker. Uh, just inventing a URL. Protocol MQTT. Yes, uh, sorry, secure MQTT. Yeah. So that says that, uh, as you can see on the right side, that you can um, you can consume this information, this message, by connecting to this server using the MQTT protocol. Uh, I'm not gonna get deeper into this because it can take super long, but of course you can specify, um, you know, this, um, how's it called? Uh, <laughs> so way to, ways of uh, authenticating and authorizing and, um, and you know, security, uh, security, um, security requirements. That's the, that's the name. So, so yeah. So pretty much, like I was saying, pretty much like uh, like Open API, right? Um, let me check. So, okay, so it's o'clock. Um, what I would like to to um, to speak a little bit more about uh, who's using an async API because we have uh, a, a concern here. We have a problem here, if you want. And it's that um, you know, as as opposed to Open API, Async API is usually used in internal uh, in in internal systems like uh, connecting to a Kafka broker, RabbitMQ, whatever IBM MQ, whatever. So what happens is that people are not keen to share this uh, Async API documents, and sometimes not even tell us that they're using Async API. So it is very hard for us to understand who are who's using uh, async KPI, and um, we just got feedback from uh, many of the many of the the companies that you can see here in the slide uh, that they're using it. Some of them just because we're helping them uh, be successful using async KPI or and, and event driven architectures, not just uh, on the async KPI side, and uh, and some of them because. Uh, like Slack, for instance, they provide a um, a public async API file that you can actually consume uh, for their event uh, API. Uh, so that's um, that. I would like to take the opportunity to be on stage here today to uh, uh, for you to speak. If you know, if you if you're using async API, or if you know someone who's using async API. We don't want to have your files. <laughs> we don't need to know all the details, but it will be great uh, to have uh, the inf this information. Like we will like we would love to know, and if possible, share with others uh, who's using async API, right? Because that I think that's important. Um, another thing about um, about the spec or the initiative itself is. Um, that it's getting more mature. Like l last uh, September, we uh, released version two. We know it's not perfect. It's actually far from perfect. Like uh, to be honest, I'm already I'm already uh, playing with uh, what could be uh, uh, an SNKP version three just to make uh, a proposal um, because it all started as a. Uh, Copy or fork of Open API, but Open API is point to point. It's client server is is request response, and uh, we try to map this into messaging, and it's like it doesn't always work. So so yeah, we're gonna we're we're still figuring out what's the best way to make uh, um, to make async API be suitable for these scenarios, distributed uh, uh, systems as scenarios. And um, and still be 
similar or with similar or with reusable parts that can be shared with OpenAPI. Um, so aside, aside from that, one of the things that I would like would love to mention is uh, and and following a little bit what Daryl said as well about uh, alternative alternative schemas, we uh, uh, since uh, since version two, let me just come here back a little bit. We have on the messages we have a we introduced a um, a field which is called schema format, right? And I don't remember exactly the MIME type, but let's say it's this one. Okay, um, it's this is gonna fail because this is not uh, supported by async API I have right now, but the cool thing about it is you can specify the the schema the schema um, the format of the schema or this alternative schema so meaning that you don't want to use it's a schema you want to use Avro for the payload you could come here and easily say that define the type record blah 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 whatever right so using the 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 Avro uh, the Avro type the Avro schema type so this uh, this is making things more uh, complicated, <laughs> of course, but more flexible as well, because now we can easily uh, make or make async API work with JSON schema, with open API schemas uh, prior to 3.1. Um, we can make it work also with Avro, with RAML data types, and uh, and then also we're planning on introducing support for protobuf and uh, for XSD, right? But um, at least every format that is uh, easily convertible to JSON, uh, it's it's easy to to be supported on async API, and we're going to work on that on, on, on the next uh, on the next year, I will say. Cool. So uh, aside, uh, so along with that, uh, we would love to to uh, we're proud to show that uh, people are are. Uh, valuing this hard work that we're doing and that we're going to keep uh, doing and uh, InfoQ and ThoughtWorks and their technology radars and, and trends, uh, trend reports, um, they um, they mentioned Async API a, as a one of the technologies that people should start assessing. Right? It's like something you should start uh, trying on, on your company. So we couldn't be happier. It's like uh, this we're super happy for that, and uh, and as always, this is a community. This is a community effort. So if you decide to start using async API in your company and don't know how to how to start, how to get how to get started, either it's spec itself, either it's tooling, either whatever, uh, feel free to to join our a uh, our Slack channel. Um, you can come here to syncapi.com. And uh, you will find that uh, there is a help menu here where you can you have a link to Slack workspace. This is an an auto invitation, so you will get immediately there. Um, and yeah, let's uh, let's let's chat uh, in the in the Slack workspace because uh, we would love to know more about use cases, the needs, and 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 we are friendly people. Where uh, and and Medi can tell you. After after this talk, so um, also <laughs> so maybe I, I'm, am I out of time? No no no, you call me friendly. So uh, I don't... okay, <laughs> yeah. To me, this is more like a meeting. It sounds it seems more like a meeting than than at all because I cannot see anyone. So <laughs> it's it's weird. Um, so yeah, as I was saying that um, no, I I want to give a, a shout out here to uh, to my team here, Wukash Gornitschki and, and Eva Morsillo. So uh, we are the three working at Async API right now uh, full time. And um, we're trying to make it, you know, make it uh, evolve as fast as possible. But we are only a team of three. And we're constantly uh, looking for uh, donations because we run on donations and all these beautiful people here um, 
that you can see on the logos are already donating. So uh, we're always trying to keep our work aside from any uh, company trying to manipulate it. So yeah, that's why uh, donations are important. And um, and yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll link, I, I encourage you to, to join us on the, on the initiative in many ways that, like I said, even if it's just to say hello on the, on the Slack workspace and say, uh, uh, say whatever, say, uh, ask questions and uh, on, or on Twitter. And if, if you can have a, make a donation, we'll be like super happy for that, of course. Yeah, Fran, two yeah. questions in one minute. Uh, uh, so from Marcin, uh, how do you model HTTP headers? Uh, I have to keep some of them for process consistency in REST part. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, do a quick. Uh, uh, so, for instance, here we have the message and we have a payload, but there is a headers, right? And uh, you can uh, you can you can type your headers here. My header uh, type string, whatever. Uh, that that should make it like and as you can see you will see it on listed that this is a, a a property that you can use in this case this is a uh this is an mqtt this is using mqtt protocol but nothing prevents you to use http or https in this case it's production so that's that's one way we also have the concept of bindings uh which is super interesting and this is gonna grow a lot in the in the future in case you have multiple protocols or multiple servers with different protocols you can have the http binding and uh, that don't remember exactly the, the the syntax because it's changing uh we're developing it right now but could be something like this right and then you define the headers there um i will have to have a look at the at the spec because it's so extensive now by the way um in future versions of this HTTP binding, what we're planning to do is that we, uh, this definition is actually a, a piece of an open API document. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? So, um, so yeah, whatever, whatever is, uh, whatever is valid for open API uh, to define uh, headers will be valid here as well on the HTTP binding. And that's something that we're working on. Last question in 10 seconds. What is the most popular protocol using SCPI so far? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I have no clue. Uh, I have no clue because uh, I, I, think, I think it's Kafka, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but most of the use cases that I see is, about, is around Kafka or WebSocket. No. But... Um, because because of the browser support, right? Uh, we, we, need to find, we, we need to invent a specification management tool to be able for you to have analytics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. that's uh, that, that's a good point. Uh, that we don't have analytics because of what I said, right? Like uh, people use it privately; they don't even have to speak to us to to use it. So it's it's hard to say. We just uh, I'm sure in the in the following months and and years as more and more companies are starting to adopt uh, async API or build products to support async API, uh, like Solas and MuleSoft and Bump and other people are doing, um, we will start getting some metrics around it. Yeah, thank and you for thank you very much for the time. Uh, thank you for this. Okay. And thank you can you. unshare your screen now. And, and and now we receive. So after talking about event-driven architecture, uh, it's it seems obvious to talk about real-time APIs. And this is why uh, we will have uh, uh, on stage uh, Kevin Jones from Nginx. Uh, Kevin Jones, uh, who is a senior product manager, and who will make a talk about asking you the question: Is your API real-time? So I will have Kevin Jones coming, and Fran, you can cut your camera. So and you can enjoy your night in this night uh, in, in a beautiful Spain country. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Hey, doing good. One second, just getting my video up here. Yeah, we hear you from really far. <laughs> See if that pops up. Otherwise, uh, ah, there we go. Perfect. Yes. Hello, Kevin. 
Good. So, Good question of the day. Are you able to share the screen? All right. Let's see if we can do this. Turn button. Uh, it's just this little. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, looks like it's gonna work. Are you able to? Uh, Not yet. I just hear you and don't see your screen yet. I think it wants me to restart Chrome because <laughs> of a security. So give me one second. Yeah, of course. Yeah, F5 is a security company, so it's obvious. So yeah, just to say, uh, we see many, many more, uh, more and more companies actually uh, involved in making their APIs real time uh, for being able to get uh, data faster, but also that enables also new user experiences. Most banks, for instance, uh, really want to have this uh, real time data uh, and real time services to be able to deliver like real time experience in a world where consumers want things that go really fast. So, this is why I think this talk is really important. And we have Kevin again. There we go. Able to share a screen. So, Kevin, perfect. The stage is yours for 25 minutes. Cool. Enjoy. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. Appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to be talking about real time APIs. Um, particularly a little bit about uh, API gateways and API management, how those can affect your infrastructure and how uh, a little bit about Nginx can maybe help you guys as well. So brief introduction, um, I have a lot to cover in this uh, 25 minutes, but uh, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm a senior product manager for Nginx. Uh, I've been at Nginx for about five years now. Uh, previous to working at Nginx, I actually managed Nginx for a SRE team. So my experience is in site reliability, managing production. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about APIs today. Uh, and I'm an open book. So if you guys have any uh, questions, feel free to open them up in the chat or send me an email. My email is still kevin at nginx.com. So let's get going. So it all, uh, if you're not familiar with the, the history of Nginx, it all got started with this, this gentleman here, Igor Sisoev. Um, Igor Sisoev was the original creator of Nginx and he created Nginx with one specific problem in mind. Uh, where basically one server couldn't handle more than 10,000 concurrent connections. And so he solved the problem by a completely different architecture using Nginx um, as a workhorse for handling those connections and offloading uh, the operations that it can handle and letting the application focus on what it needs to do, right? Um, and over the years, it's adopted a lot of uh, traction. Uh, we are the number one most used web server on the internet today. Um, if you look online, there's roughly a little bit over 400 million websites running on Nginx. And uh, I think all the work that Igor and his team did on the product to make it such a reliable and useful tool has really shown over the years. Um, also, if you look at installations of Nginx or Nginx Plus, which is our commercial version, about 40%, according to our user base, are actually using Nginx as an API gateway. So it's very relevant that we are in this space um, of API access and uh, acting as an API uh, gateway or an API management tool uh, for those APIs. Um, and to, to speak to that, you know, there is a good amount of um, things that we can look at to see where the market is for APIs and why they're so important. Uh, firstly, we can look at the overall growth in APIs. So ever since uh, June of 2005, the programmable web has been uh, basically tracking the overall growth of exposed uh, APIs on the internet. And you can see over here dur during the duration of time all the way up to the last report that they did, which was in 2013, uh, there's been a tremendous growth in those publicly exposed APIs. And this continues to be somewhat of a hockey puck growth where we see that this is just going to increase and increase more and more over time. And in fact, uh, according to Akamai's traffic review and looking at their overall API traffic, uh, about 83% of their web traffic that goes through their CDNs are actually API driven and API uh, related. Um, we also can look at uh, the total of uh, connected devices on the web. So we know that as of 2015, there were a total of 15 billion devices connected to the internet. And uh, with the adoption of newer technologies like 5G and some of the other uh, functionality that's coming down um, from microservices architectures and newer modern ways like containers to deploy applications, 
we're seeing that even grow more. And this is going to actually grow all the way up to about 75 billion by the year 2025, which is about an increase of about 500%. So um, the big question I asked for you guys is, are you guys ready to grow your infrastructure five times what it is today? Uh, especially if you're dealing with uh, devices that are connected to the internet uh, on the outside world. Uh, we can also look at uh, this report from the IDC, which says that overall 71% of most organizations accept, uh, basically expect to increase the amount of API traffic that they generate uh, over those two years. I think that is very telling based on the other metrics that we're tracking. Um, and you get the appointments that there is a, a strong need uh, to be able to um, serve those APIs. But uh, why, why is it important that your, your customers, your clients that are connecting your APIs have a good experience, right? Uh, well, it really comes down to, to the idea that from a performance perspective, a typical API client is external. You might have internal APIs, but the ones that you're most worried about are external APIs for security reasons and for customer experience reasons, and maybe for business to business type negotiations where you're uh, transferring data between APIs. Um, and they need to be able to be accessible quickly uh, and reliably. And so if we look at um, other companies too, they actually have a consumption model where uh, their actually primary case of revenue is actually coming from these APIs as well. If you look at something like Expedia, uh, I think Expedia has about 90% of their revenue that actually comes from external APIs working with other vendors to be able to provide uh, real-time travel um, uh, capabilities to those vendors. So there's a lot to be heard. There's also the case for IOTs as well. And so if we look at the industries that are most in need of a real-time API, uh, we can look at the first, which is um, people that are using their uh, application for uh, customer experience, right? They're going to go on that app and they need to get an Uber or they need to get a Lyft. Which one's faster? Which one's more reliable? Which which one do they have a better experience with, right? So those are the users, those are the devices, uh, applications, real clients that are using those. Uh, and then we can look at fraud, right? So like banking, like if you have a uh, um, uh, authentication framework for credit credit authorization, and uh, you know you have a slight delay in your uh, processing time, right? You're taking payments less as much time as you could, right? So it's all about being able to quickly validate transactions so that they don't oh, think, oh, something's wrong with my Visa card. Let me just get my American Express card and use that, right? You want to uh, try to um, give a good experience and be able to detect quickly any kind of fraudulent activity as well. So uh, real-time APIs do play a part in that. And then the last part is uh, other connected devices, particularly IoT devices, right? So these are things that are, uh, you know, Amazon, Google, all of the different uh, outlets um, here in my office. If I want to say, hey, Google, studio lights off, I can turn my studio lights off. Hey, Google, studio lights on, right? Um, if you guys have those in your, in, your, uh, in your home, you'll know. Hey, Google, studio lights on. Um, so the idea is here that we're going... Studio lights on, is that right? <laughs> yes, you get the idea. Everyone's using these, right? So um, if we talk about uh, real-time APIs, the idea is that clients are connecting through, they're most likely hitting more than one API, right? You don't have one API in your organization. You have probably many, many APIs that are doing many different things. And so you need something in front of that API. Typically it's called an API gateway a load balancer, reverse proxy. It has lots of names, uh, but we look at it, um, uh, it does a lot of different things, right? So when you enable something like that, uh, you're enabling an API gateway or a reverse proxy, as you might call it, to do things like routing. So being able to route the traffic appropriately based on the request that comes through. Identify that person. First of all, what API do they really need access? What version of the API do they need access to? Um, how often can they uh, get access to that API? Uh, maybe you want to redirect that user to uh, a different authentication schema based on uh, the, the HTTP request. 
Uh, perhaps, perhaps you want to do other things like um, require special authentication rules, right? Where you maybe say, okay, well, this client, they need to be able to pass a JSON web token as opposed to this other client can use an API key. Uh, being able to make those smart decisions on your API infrastructure. And then also just being able to not only authenticate those users, but also authorize them. So in other words, yeah, this user is authenticated through the network and they have access to this API, but how much access do they have? And being able to limit the access that they have based on all of the uh, information in the request. Also do things like uh, rate limiting, limiting the request rate of how often uh, someone who's unauthenticated can access that or someone who is. Um, being able to do additional security stuff like access control lists, like finding out, well, what country is this user in? Maybe we only want to expose this API to users in the United States. So we should take a really close granular look at uh, their um, IP information to see if they fall into a database IP in the United States. Uh, or Canada or whatever. Uh, maybe we don't wanna allow Russia uh, connections for a specific API, we can block that. Maybe we wanna block China, whatever it is. Um, and then also on top of that, being able to do advanced load balancing. So being able to accept high amounts of load when the traffic increases, if it's a situation where it's something like a retailer or like Expedia um, on specific holidays where there's sales or uh, a spike in traffic, you need something that's gonna sit there and, and load balance and protect your APIs um, and distribute the traffic evenly across your cluster, right? Uh, and then also caching is somewhat of a, uh, sometimes people don't think about that, but there is situations where you need to cache certain types of requests so that in the case that the API does go down completely, maybe there's some stale responses that can be cached there from the caching layer. But when you start adding all of this stuff, um, it does add a lot of complexity. Uh, into the application infrastructure. And so um, again, we, we look at this and we say, okay, well, um, what happens when you start doing all this stuff at the API gateway layer? Is it affecting the overall latency? In other words, are your clients getting a worse experience than they were if they were just directly cons consuming the API? Um, so the overall goal is to keep the latency down under 30 meg milliseconds um, is the really the best case scenario. Some customers uh, say that 100 milliseconds is good, uh, but most of our customers want to keep it under around 30 milliseconds and then keeping the performance up on those application servers. So allowing them to do what they need to do to serve the application um, and keep your SLA on your per instance request per second for your APIs. So latency down, request per second up. Um, and then we say, okay, well, over 90%, according to another survey uh, that was done, about 90% of organizations expect a latency of less than 50 milliseconds, like I was saying, while almost 60%, so more than half, actually want it to be below 20 milliseconds. So there's definitely a need for reliable real-time APIs. So how do you monitor and measure that stuff? Um, so we have a tool, I'm not saying this is the only way you should do it. You probably are gonna need to have robust logging you probably should have something like uh, open tracing integration and some kind of way to uh, look at overall request rate. Um, I would recommend having some kind of dashboard that does that. But this is a good way to start, to just take a look at what your APIs are doing today. Uh, this is available on our GitHub and it's under Nginx Inc GitHub under RT API. And it is open source. It's built on Golang by one of our engineers. Uh, and it actually works really well um, and it, it generates PDFs for your API so that you can see what your overall percentile is. So we can see, okay, well, here's the latency from top to bottom, right? Um, or I should say from bottom to top. And then we have the overall percentile of that traffic. So of 99.9999% from zero to 99.9%, .9 where is the curve of your API? And so the nice thing about this is it's actually giving you um, uh, a accurate look at your, your uh, millisecond response on the API by taking into account the waiting time um, of your actual uh, load balancing, uh, or sorry, of your latency tool, which is this tool. So it's gonna give you a very accurate uh, percentage for your latency. Um, you can also use just go get to install this. And this is the, the graph that you're gonna generate. And you can see here, this is a pretty good API that is responding on average probably somewhere in the nine to 10 millisecond ratio. 
You can also use, if you're using Nginx, um, again, it's a very popular open source tool, but Nginx Plus is our commercial version. With Nginx Plus, we expose a bunch of extra metrics. There's over 100 metrics that are uh, things like uh, request per second, um, current connections, connections a second. And then we have a product called Nginx Controller, which is a way to visualize and get a real in-depth look at that traffic over a long period of time. So if you can see here that you can do it by one hour, four hours, one day, two days, one weeks. Um, and I'm not saying a controller is the way to go specifically for that, but this does help if you're an Nginx uh, shop or if you're looking to adopt something like an API gateway and use Nginx, uh, this will really help you visualize your overall traffic uh, and get an idea of what's going on with that. And so how, how can Nginx help? So first I like to always level set and talk about the differences between an API gateway and an API management tool. Uh, some people tend to use these and transpose these. An API gateway is what is doing all of the authentication and it's doing the authorization. It's doing the routing, being able to route that traffic, impose rate limits, handle exceptions, stuff like that. It's basically, I call it the heavy lifting because it's the workhorse. It's what's sitting probably on a container or on a virtual machine, maybe next to your application, more likely on its own dedicated instance where it's doing all the access control and doing the routing inside as a, a Linux binary. And then we have API management, which is the idea where you're managing that policy, you're analyzing and showing metrics like I just showed on the previous screen. And you're also providing a portal for developers to go in and give documentation about their API. Um, so there's really two sides to the story. Um, where F5 and Nginx come together is, and, and why uh, F5 actually bought Nginx, is we're very close to the code. We're very close to the API gateway spec here, uh, where we have Nginx controller, which is our API management tool. And we have Nginx plus or Nginx open source, which can be utilized as an API gateway. Um, and the idea here is that the controller is able to give you a GUI and an API that you can enforce and all your policy that you want to enable uh, your different teams to have role-based access to configure Nginx at scale. And Nginx Plus can be deployed as an API gateway, whether it's in a container or on a virtual machine or on bare metal or inside of a public or private cloud. Um, and so this is a um, uh, separate approach where the controller and the API gateway are deployed independently. Um, and so when we built the API management, we, we wanted to focus on two principles. One is we wanted to use the number one uh, Nginx, or I should say number one API gateway available, which to us, we already owned it, it's Nginx, right? So we built everything around Nginx Plus as that API gateway, right? And then we wanted to not do any artificial additives. We wanted everything to be native to the Nginx. So we wanted it to be tooling that, that we personally built and deployed uh, as a solution. So we don't use any third party uh, tools. We don't use any third party scripting. Uh, we only use native functionality that is built into Nginx or is a module that is written uh, from Nginx. That doesn't mean you can't use your own modules if you'd like to um, in certain situations, but that's what we focused on. And we also designed with uh, three things in mind. One is to be able to automate via an API. So everything that you can do through the uh, GUI, you can do through the API. This allows you to use Ansible, Chef, Puppet, or some other tool to be able to orchestrate your Nginx configuration. And we also wanted it to make it easy for microservices to be able to connect that traffic. So in order to do that, we had to make the data plane, the API gateway, very small and lightweight. And so I think right now the smallest instance of Nginx is about 34 megabytes in size. It fits in a container. And it can either be deployed next to your application as a sidecar, or it can be deployed independently in its own container. Uh, again, you can deploy it on a virtual machine or bare metal if you decide, but we wanted to be microservice friendly, right? Uh, and then we also wanted to be able to give the ability to improve uh, users' API infrastructure automatically. So this goes all the way back to the real-time API where we want the performance as a main priority and the ability to scale and, and uh, do load balancing and all the good stuff that Nginx is really good at um, in that environment as well. And so we we built Controller a long time ago, but we added a new portal to that, an API management portal, which is a separate um, solution that allows you to do all of this functionality, configure the routing, 
configure the access control, uh, manage JSON web tokens, what kind of access they have, manage API keys, pretty much all the stuff that I showed you guys earlier on the what does an API gateway or what does a uh, reverse proxy do, we baked into that, that tab so that it's pretty much good to go. Um, and another thing that we also focused on is we decoupled the uh, API management and the API gateway. We didn't want any particular dependencies to be in place for the API gateway um, and the API management where they needed to be constantly in communication with each other. Uh, what this allows you to do is it allows you to deploy Nginx wherever it needs to be as an API gateway. And if for some reason the controller goes down or the controller needs to do some kind of database lookup or needs to do something, that's not affecting the overall latency of the request that's coming through. In other words, if I'm a user and I'm connecting to one of my APIs and I go through Nginx and Nginx needs to do some kind of um, authentication and authorization, all that functionality is baked into Nginx at that layer. So it doesn't need to make another sub, sub request to the API controller uh, or so the Nginx controller or the API management plane to decide, well, what am I going to allow that person to do? We push all that stuff and keep it in its own runtime that is sitting next to um, wherever Nginx is running. So there's no added latency. And this is what sets um, Nginx aside as probably the, the most reliable and fastest API, API management gateway solution on the market today. Um, and any kind of third-party scripting, we don't we don't use. We don't uh, use Lua. We have our own engine script, which is, right, we call it JavaScript for Nginx. It used to be called engine script. Um, and we did, again, we don't use any third-party modules. Everything is native and built into Nginx um, or in the JavaScript coding that's on that API gateway. And so again, uh, just to recap, we are uh, the num we're using the number one API gateway. Um, a lot of companies actually have built their API management tool around Nginx. They've actually used Nginx open source and built around that. Um, but we feel like ours is the number one um, available because it has no artificial additives. And uh, we have a very flexible architecture, right? Um, they can essentially be deployed um, pretty much anywhere, right? Whether you're running in containers, you're running in virtual machines, bare metal, it uh, doesn't matter. And uh, again, we're optimized, optimized for automation. So because the controller is all API driven, if you decide, hey, I want to pump this into Ansible or Chef or Puppet or something like that, or maybe you have your own uh, you know, shell scripts and or Python scripts that you've created to do that stuff, you can easily do that just by making HTTP requests to our controller API. So thank you. Um, again, my name is Kevin Jones. Um, happy to answer some questions here right now and see if you guys have any uh, questions that I can answer for you. Hi, Kevin. Uh, one question about uh, what is the main challenge uh, behind the scenes to uh, achieve such performance and going so low into, into latency? Yeah, so I, I think one of the difficult things that some of our competitors have had to, to solve is how do you do a proper authentication and authorization uh, without doing database lookups, right? Without doing uh, sub requests to another service. Um, and I think that's the most difficult thing is um, when you're designing an API gateway is you want to have it as independent and almost give it as much power as it can to make its own decisions. Um, and so I think that's where we've kind of solved that problem for people with um, this solution. What is today the the main users of uh, uh, Nginx um, in for for API Gateway? In a sense that today we had a lot of questions. I think it's what's it related. We had a lot of questions about performance for microservices communication or service meshes, uh, right? Is it a sweet spot for Nginx? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think part of it is because the you know the overall size of Nginx is very uh, you know very small. Uh, the tarball is about three megabytes. And again, our, our smallest container is about 34 megabytes. And I think we've, we've been being, we've been used as a reverse proxy for the last, you know, 10 years. Um, and people are still using us for that. So I, I don't think there's, um, as far as feature set and functionality, we have a lot of this stuff built into the product that's already there um, to sit into those microservices uh, frameworks and act as a, uh, you know, reliable reverse proxy. So yeah, I think, 
I think it lends to the, it goes all the way back to Igor's original architecture is, you know, it, it's very reliable and fast and can handle large amounts of connections. And so we're a good fit there. Yeah. Last question. How does a fault tolerance topology looks like using Nginx in 30 yeah, yeah. The fault tolerance, you know, there's, there's two ways people tend to do it. Um, one is they use uh, some kind of high availability. Um, we, we recommend using something like VRRP. Um, where you can fail over the traffic using a, a network, um, the VRP network protocol. Another common use case is to use some other, depending on where you're deploying it. If you're using it in a cloud, using another cloud load balancer to sit in front of your Nginx clusters uh, to do uh, high availability from that point. So you have a cluster of Nginx sitting behind there. Or if you're on premise, use something like an F5 LTM um, that sits in front and handles that high availability. Uh, there is a later version too, where you could use something like global DNS too, if you decided to, but uh, I think that's usually a last resort because um, you have to worry about DNS propagation and doing failover can be a little tricky. But for some people, if you're in multiple availability zones, that's, um, that's your only option is using something like either Route 53 or uh, a GTM if you're using F5 uh, to do global traffic management. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for answering the questions. Uh, you can now uh, unshare your screen so we can have the next presenter. Thank you very much for uh, being there. Uh, so the next presenter is uh, also a, a, a member of the community, is a book author, book about APIs you won't hate. Uh, he is a, a community enabler, and he's a contributor about many, many aspects of uh, uh, API specification. So really glad to have you, Phil. On, on stage. So it's the first conference actually where you don't come, uh, don't ride a bicycle, bicycle, right? Yeah, I'm having to settle for wearing my oh, bicycle. Yeah, bicycle. I, uh, didn't, didn't get <laughs> to ride here. All is now let me, let me just see if I can share my screen. Yeah, that's a challenge. Yeah. Ooh, open system preferences. Okay. That's I have to do a couple of things. Do you have any jokes prepared? Uh, uh, jokes about APIs? Oh, there is soap in the restrooms. <laughs> ah, give it a rest. That's that's one. Uh, another okay, joke. I'm gonna have to quickly re restart, and then I'll be back in two oh. seconds. Okay. So actually, uh, you ask a question about uh, about jokes. Uh, at some point, Eric Vilde, one of one of the speakers, launched the API Haiku Challenge. So if you're familiar with haikus, these not familiar with haikus, these are short poems like originally Japanese, right? I think it's a five, uh, five syllabus, seven syllabus, five syllabus, right? If you really want to respect, that shows the evanescence of things, right? And I think at some point I've tried to do some, uh, and the one I had was APIs always on stage for representations, right? That was my haiku uh, at the time. So if you have any haiku, uh, that comes to to your mind, uh, you can uh, uh, you can type them in the chat. It's not easy to uh, make a haiku, uh, you know, on the fly. Uh, but uh, yeah, you you can still you can still try. It, it's funny. It's funny. Uh, so we're waiting for uh, uh, Phil to come back. And yes, actually, Phil, uh, uh, two hundred OK errors. Uh, that's a haiku. I don't know. <laughs> or that's a maybe a that's oh okay okay so i get it <laughs> uh yeah that, we, we can try we can try these jokes right i think we've lost feel in translation into into the browser we have some some some, some uh, but but it only works for uh, feel. It's <laughs> yeah. We can play with HTTP status code too, right? Yeah, yeah. The share screen button is the new can connect to the projector. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. So it's always about screen sharing at some point, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's screen sharing the problem. Don't don't blame the button. Don't blame the connectors. It's screen sharing the issue. Uh, 
Okay, we're doing all the HTTP errors. HTTP code, right? <laughs> yeah, it uh, yeah, it doesn't look like so much like a sc screen sharing button. It looks like a yeah, at least on my side it looks like a screen. Yeah, but the fact is, there is a, a bar on it. Looks like uh, yes, looks like nothing. Alex Web, that's Aiku. Consult HTTP cat for anything else. That's my Aiku. So if you, I don't know if you've seen the the movie Inception, but I think maybe Phil is in a other dimension where times goes slower. Or he fell into a uh, he fell into a, a a black hole. So the times for him, uh, for us, infinity, but for him, it's just he's just trying to restart Chrome. <laughs> Phil is getting on his bike. Uh, yeah. Actually, actually, it's uh, it's more it's funnier when he's not here. We have great jokes on the on the chat. Hey, Phil, spend one or more one or two more minutes lost in uh, in uh, in the vacuum of the the browser. Yeah, we'll have to talk faster than usual. We'll try to keep his twenty five minutes. Yeah. Hello, I'm sorry, I'm back. That was really stressful and hard. No problem. Uh, after your talk, please read the, the comments in the, in the chat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I assume everyone's making fun. Right, uh, Perfect. there we go. Sound is great, screen is great, 25 minutes, let's go. Fantastic. So everybody present. My computer speaking at me in Dutch. I'm here in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, and so I will be talking today about automating API style guides. Um, my name is Phil Sturgeon, known as Crashy McSiderface on the internet. Um, and I generally talk about APIs, crashing bikes, and trying to save the planet. Uh, if you want to find me, I'm at Phil Sturgeon on all the things. So I work for a company called Stoplight, who uh, is working on making a bunch of tooling to help you make APIs that are better and make them faster and stronger. Um, and one of the tools, uh, one of the things, one of the things that I personally have a, a big stake in is is trying to help people build good quality APIs. I wrote a book, build APIs you won't hate, because everyone builds an API and then they hate it. Um, and one of the biggest problems that I come across is people never really know what to name things. They don't know what data format to use. And and so when you have a company with a lot of APIs, right? In that last talk. Um, we saw that the number of APIs is just skyrocketing. People are making more and more and more. And instead of having, instead of a company having one API, now you might have a hundred, right? Because people are doing microservices. And um, and so when you have a bunch of different developers, if, if you ask a hundred different developers how to make an API, you're going to get 105 different opinions because people just change their minds all the time. Um, so inconsistency can take the form of like random naming conventions and endpoints and parameters, uh, different entire formats being used, like uh, how JSON API, Siren, or a series of different custom snowflakes that all differ from each other, and and even different from uh, even one API can have different data formats in different versions of itself. So if you talk to version two and version three, you get completely different uh, shapes of responses, let alone the data. Um, and a bunch of different APIs can use different security schemes or unconventional status codes. You might have um, something sending errors on a 200 because they're wild like that, and but other ones use actual status codes. So um, it can be really hard to kind of build up any conventions if, if things are super inconsistent, right? Um, but beyond the consistency just feeling nice, um, inconsistency isn't really about, you know, just wanting to feel nice. It, it's uh, developers can make assumptions. Your consumers can make assumptions, which cause mistakes. Um, if if they're worried about making mistakes or because they've been burned uh, on that recently, they're going to constantly be rechecking your documentation, which is wasting a lot of time for them. So that's like more time they could have spent successfully integrating with your with your API and, and creating products that make you money. Um, they can't reuse generic code 
between different APIs, which is super unfortunate. You have to build custom things for every API you integrate with. Um, and, and, and also it can just look silly. If you've got you know five different APIs you expose to to different people and they all look different, you just kind of look like you're half assing things. So um, you don't want to do that, and and it can all just lead to a, a bad developer experience in general. Right? Uh, something I have seen happen time and time and time again because not only do I work at Stoplight helping them build tools, but I, I run a, like a support group for API developers um, on on APIs you won't hate Slack channel. Um, and I also do a lot of consulting for people. And a really common problem is something as simple as uh, an error message sometimes is a string and sometimes is an object of a load of other stuff. Um, and somebody might have seen a few errors come back from API A and a few other APIs in the company, but then API B does an object. And what happens when you do this? You see errors like this. <laughs> um, you just see object, object, because JavaScript. So you want to try and avoid stuff like this. And you want to standardize. Um, uh, your APIs, but standardizing APIs that already exist is quite a hard job. Um, if something is already in production and you want to change it to make it be consistent, there's not much business value to doing that because you've already got an API. You'd have to change an API, which involves breaking your consumers. Um, so are you going to make a V2 just so that you can make things consistent? Or are you going to wait for V2 to happen and then have eventual consistency? Um, are you going to duplicate endpoints via evolution and then kind of just make those new ones be nice and, and consistent? Or uh, some people genuinely build backends for front ends almost entirely for this reason. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons that you should or should not use BFFs in various different contexts, but I personally feel like having a really inconsistent ecosystem is not <laughs> a reason to do it. Um, and other people just casually recommend rewriting everything in GraphQL or gRPC or Vulkan or some other twerp or whatever. Um, and again, there's a lot of reasons to use these things. And there's a lot of reasons to maybe rewrite an entire ecosystem. But having inconsistent APIs is, is not that reason. Um, if you're a bit of a visual thinker, look at it like this. You've got a bunch of different APIs, and you've got a client that's talking to them. And they're all completely different from each other, different data formats. Um, different error formats, different uh, authentication schemes, right? One's uh, HTTP digest, the other one's OAuth, the other one's whatever, um, uh, open API. And so that client has got to build a whole bunch of code uh, to, to handle all of that. And that, that client is fairly fed up with having to do that. So that client might build a BFF. And then that client can talk to that one API that they control, which has got nice, consistent, just one way of handling authentication. They don't have to have five different sessions managed. Um, and, and that's great for them. But uh, when you have a bunch of different clients, then they all end up building their own BFFs. And this might sound silly, um, but when I was working at my last company, we had hundreds of APIs and, and loads of different clients, un unbeknownst to other teams, were all building their own BFFs so that they could have a consistent experience. And so we were basically um, like, it's not even squaring, right? It's just we were creating so much more technology and wasting so much time creating all of these kind of duplicate but slightly different APIs just so things can be consistent. You kind of wonder, why don't we just make the APIs be consistent in the first place? And there's a lot of ways you can do this too, which aren't quite so wasteful. Um, we just learned a whole bunch about API gateways, and that's absolutely right. Um, an API gateway can solve a whole bunch of problems. Um, how you handle uh, rate limiting, how you handle caching, how you handle authentication can be made consistent across all of them. So maybe API A, B, and C were built in different different programming languages with different frameworks, with different popular popular authentication tools, and, and the authentication logic was built into the, the code base, but you can just delete that code. And, and you know handle it carefully, but you can move the authentication to the API gateway, and that will create a lot of consistency across your APIs. But not everything can be handled that way. Like if you have wildly different naming conventions for your endpoints and your properties, then the API gateway won't solve that. It's just part of the equation. So, how do we solve the rest of it? Uh, design guidelines. I first came across the concept of API design guidelines um, on apistylebook.com. And there's a bunch of these websites. Um, sorry, there's a there's a bunch of companies who have posted their idea of what they want an API to be, uh, what they consider to be a good API. They're not speaking definitively, um, but they are. They're writing down all of the decisions and opinions that they've made of how to make good quality standard APIs, and then they share them with other people. 
so they can use that internally and other people can use it if they like. Um, and this is everything from um, Adidas, Atlassian, uh, Microsoft, PayPal, White House. <laughs> the White House did one. That was uh, Obama era. Um, I don't know what the current opinions are on, on APIs, but um, yeah, there's a bunch of them on there. And Heroku, it's a really good place to get started. Um, if you're Googling for style guides, then they come under a lot of different names. Some people call them design guide or design guidelines or style guide or style book. They're all basically the same thing. Uh, so James Higginbottom uh, wrote a great article about it and it will come up in your Googling. Um, the goal for your API style guide should be to advise teams designing APIs towards a more consistent API with other APIs across the organization. So, um, you know, some old APIs may not match this style guide, but over time, um, new APIs and new functionality and new versions of those APIs will eventually become uh, consistent. And some of the things that you might want to create rules for, uh, I personally recommend using RFC 7807 for errors, right? Instead of 25 different error formats and every single API doing them slightly differently, you can use this one uh, standard that's been written for error formats. Um, you don't need to make decisions when there's already a standard for it. You can just use the standard. Um, you can use UUID for um, IDs in URLs and bodies to avoid having like, to avoid exposing auto incrementing IDs and having people plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four and download your entire data set. You can create all these rules um, for things that make for a good API. And you can avoid the need to like educate a lot of developers because as we said, there's so many people getting into API development. They don't have time to learn everything. I, I don't, I, I'd love it if every single API developer read my book and a bunch of other books and, and just really learned how to do everything really well. But you don't always have time to do that. And so if you can kind of create a style guide that just says, do this, you'll avoid this problem. They don't necessarily need to learn everything about the API world. They just learn this one thing. Um, and so creating um, get slash helps Hatios. Uh, creating get slash health helps monitoring. Posts should return 201 or 202, and errors should not be on 200, right? All these things can just be written into a style guide so that people just do it. Problem is, a lot of people use, for, for a long time, all of those websites I, I mentioned, they're all just a website, uh, some sort of documentation, a CMS, a wiki. Some people make like a Google slideshow or keynote. Uh, other people use random PDFs. I've seen spreadsheets of style guides, which is super weird. Um, at, or example, open API files, like uh, Salesforce do this, a few other companies do this. They just make one uh, like de facto open API file that has a lot of good ideas written in it and some comments, I guess. And then everyone goes to check that now and then. Um, but it's that none of these solutions are machine readable or particularly useful apart from a human being staring at it. And Honestly, most developers aren't gonna read the entire manifesto. If you have a hundred developers and you spend this long time building an API style guide, they're not all gonna read it. And if they do, they won't remember it in a month or six months or a year. And if they, you know, even if they do remember exactly what you wrote when you first wrote it, they're not gonna reread it every single month looking for new rules and new suggestions and new ideas that you've put in. So that stuff gets out of date pretty quick. Um, I did a very highly scientific Twitter poll which had 78 replies. Uh, and I basically asked people, how do they approach their API style guide? Do they have, mo most people don't have one. 20% um, on, on website, a couple of, a surprising number with the example open API. And only 11% of people um, do uh, or API linter rule set. And that's what we can talk about now. The two types of rules that you might wanna create, you can cr help people create better open API or you can help people create better APIs. Um, so the open API is describing an API. You can either give people feedback on the open API they've written and be like, hey, why don't you add some descriptions to your parameters so that people know what this thing actually does? Um, and that makes better documentation. Or you can suggest that people add uh, default and example values so that creates better mocks when you run it through something like Prism. Um, but you can also suggest people make better APIs by looking at the API that open API is describing and complaining if they use a non-standard naming convention for the endpoints or the properties, or they use some sort of crap security approach. Um, so you can, you can do both. And if you've used Stoplight Studio, you might be fairly familiar with some of this. Uh, this is the editor that we use so that you don't have to like hand wrangle your own YAML. Um, Spectral in Stoplight has a default open API rule set and it will give you a bunch of errors like this. 
Um, basically, it gives you a bunch of feedback on, on what it thinks is good open API. So it reminds you about features a lot of people forget about, like tags and descriptions, and it will just help you make better stuff. And you can tweak that default rule set, or you can totally replace it, and you can go um, as creative as you want with custom rules. And so this uh, Spectral is the engine for this under the hood. Um, this is one I, I made. Uh, a rule called API home, you must have a root path, right? It's just gotta be there. An extension to that is um, API home get. So if you have uh, a get, if you have a, a root one, it needs to have a get. Um, you can get really creative with this stuff. Uh, you can say all paths should be kebab case, which is kind of lowercase and hyphenated. And so you can use these built-in functions. We have a function called casing, function options. The type is kebab and you can change the, the thing to, slashes so that you can have something slash something slash. Um, this amazing one from uh, Lorna Mitchell and Michael Heap is suggesting that people, this is a, a JSON path. If you're familiar with the syntax, if you're not, you can Google JSON path. So given uh, this JSON path, um, you can say the version number of my open API file must be semver. So it, it uses regex here, everyone's favorite, to make sure there's three numbers. Um, this this rule will basically deny HTTP basic. So it will look at the components, it will look at the security schemas, and if any of them, uh, if the scheme uh, of the scheme field matches basic, it will say boo, no, don't don't do that. Use something else. Um, this is an example. This one is a little wild. Uh, errors should support either RFC seven eight zero seven or JSON API errors. That's we work, we had two different error formats that are in popular contention, and I'd rather you, people used one or the other instead of infinite possibilities. So in this one, you can say, um, look at all the paths, um, look at their responses, and if, uh, uses a little bit of regex on a filter, <laughs> if the uh, status code starts with four or five, so an error, uh, look at the content, and then uh, look to see the keys of that content, and is it um, JSON API or problem XML or problem JSON? So those are the allowed MIME types. I asked the community for their rules um, and some really interesting ones popped up. Um, this one, patch request content type. So it will throw an error if, uh, if looking in the paths, if all the paths, the property uh, is equal to patch and the request body has content, which is equal to application JSON, then it will fail um, because paths, uh, sorry, patch cannot use application JSON. Why? Well, they have this other suggestion here, which is uh, we prefer application slash merge hyphen patch uh, for patch requests. So a lot of API developers have never heard of uh, merge patch, but now you have, you have an error showing up in your editor telling you to go check that out. So now you have something to Google for, and it's just a, a nice way of handling patch. Uh, and even more advanced, if you don't want to mess around with that DSL or the DSL isn't powerful enough, you can't use those keywords and the, the built-in functions to achieve whatever your goal is. Um, you can write your own custom functions and uh, you can wrap, package all spectral rule sets up in an NPM um, uh, NPM module, or uh, you, you can do plain text YAML if you're just using the DSL, but if you wanna use custom JavaScript functions, you have to package that as an NPM module. Um, but this one, write good, is basically a, uh, I think English like dictionary checker, and it basically checks to see if you have written valid English, and if you haven't, then it will fail. Um, so this 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 rule is used to say like it must be valid English, which you can use for names and summaries and things like that. So if you're using Stoplight Studio, then any of these custom rules, any of these custom functions will show up just like any other function. Um, and it would be baked right in. So while people are working on editing uh, in Stoplight Studio, they'll get feedback on that. And we're working on making it show up in the form, like in the GUI version as well. So uh, whether you're using code view or form view, you'll see these errors. Um, but more interestingly than just being in studio, uh, Spectral CLI exists. So you can run this as continuous integration. You can run it in your dev environment. You can run it wherever you want. And you can make sure that the open API and JSON schema and async API, it supports loads of different formats. You can even define your own formats, but um, you can make sure that the, uh, 
the APA description matches the APA style guide. Um, so here I have an APA so you won't hate.yaml, which is one I'm creating. I'll, I'll share this and there'll be, uh, there'll be links to my talk on, on Twitter if you follow me. Um, but basically it's a bunch of rules and functions that, that are very opinionated um, that tell you how to make a better API. And so here's an example of that rule saying on line 19, uh, we have a warning saying, hey, don't use HTTP basic, right? So this rule will show up in the CLI. Um, we also have VS Code Spectral. So if you don't feel like using Stoplight Studio, um, you can just download this. Or if it's not even for open API, you can use it for anything. I use it for you know messing with Kubernetes files with a style guide. You can create a style guide for anything, but um, you can basically say, hey, what's that HTTP basic doing there? Please get rid of that. And if you hover over, you'll get an error too. Um, and there's also a Spectral GitHub action. So you can create this one rule set and then use it in all the different places so no one's ever going to miss anything. Um, and it's important to point out that like API design reviews are never going to be completely replaced by automation, right? Right now, most API reviews are handled by a team of like API gatekeepers or the API design review committee. And they're kind of this big important step. And before you get changes made, uh, to the API or before your design is signed off, before you can start creating it or before new functionality is, is, is merged. However you do it, design first or code first, the design has to be approved by humans and you're still gonna need that. But most of the work that those kind of gatekeepers are doing could easily be replaced by automation. You, you could easily have the same number of gatekeepers uh, handling a much larger number of APIs, or you could let a few of them get on with more interesting, important work um, while still being just as effective because um, pretty much a vast majority of those rules could be automated. All of the dictionary, all of the naming conventions, all of the, is it pluralized or not? That that all can be automated. But the review stuff that needs to be done um, by humans is like, does this make sense in our ecosystem? Um, do, do these words imply the correct meaning? Um, have we used the term account properly? Because there's a, a different type of account over there, which means like company, but here account means like uh, some potential sales thing. Um, and, and so you can have kind of humans really checking that you have a good API design um, uh, without, you know, without having to waste their time checking to see if you've pluralized things and have underscores and stuff like that. So um, yeah. If you use API design first, the real benefit is that you can have feedback on your API like as it's being designed, before it's being coded, before it's got to production, before it's even made it like into any sort of code. You, you create this open API before you've built any of your code and you get feedback that, that shapes and, and avoids problems that a lot of developers don't even know what they are. So um, yeah, then you've got it in CI. So the build's gonna fail if they don't follow your rules and you can you can add in new rules over time and, and kind of make APIs better over time as you add in more rules. So um, give it a try. There we go. I think, uh, I think that we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, we're, 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 we have two or let's say two or three minutes for questions because we have the, the panel in 10 minutes and for people to have a break. Uh, I, I have one question mostly about uh, uh, the the collaboration. So, how do you onboard enough stakeholders into engaging into writing API guidelines? So, normally it's the um, the API champion or the um, kind of the the API governance people. They'll just do it, right? If you're if you're enabling this on um, on continuous integration, then you only, you just need. In the past, I've talked to different teams and said like, "Hey, team one, team two, team three, do you want to do this?" Um, but the, the world of kind of API governance tooling doesn't really exist yet. It's being worked on. It's on the roadmap for Stoplight. Um, at the moment, API governance is you have a, you have a CLI tool, you should run it and find out what happens. But in the future, it will be, um, you know, you can automatically enable this for, for any APIs in your organization. Um, you will get reports from people who are breaking rules and you can go and talk to them about like, hey, why did you turn these rules off? Um, this this sort of kind of API governance functionality will be pretty much used by the API governance teams. And it's the people who are manually doing it all right now can just stop manually doing it. They can kind of automate some of that work. So one question, does this, does Spectral come with the base, with base set of rules you were referring to? 
Yep, yeah, built in, it's got some rules for async API and some rules for open API. They stay fairly unopinionated about your API specifically. So if you want to have rules about your API, I'm gonna make my uh, APIs you won't hate rule set available. It'll be on the readme um, when I get that pull request done. But um, yeah, it, it helps you write good open API. It just doesn't tell you how to write good APIs yet, if that makes sense. Yeah, last one, is there a feature parity? parity? of Stoplight Studio and VS Code extension? Uh, Studio, Stoplight Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So custom rule sets, custom rules, um, custom functions, all of that stuff, all of that stuff works. We keep them both up to date. Same with the GitHub action. They're all, they're all doing the same thing. OK, last question before the panel we have in 10 minutes. Uh, when APIs you want hate to? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I have kicked off the, we're going to open source it. Basically, um, in the last couple of years, since the last book, everything has changed. HTTP2 changed everything. Everything is completely different now. GraphQL popped up. There's a lot of different stuff to talk about. So I'm going to open source the efforts and get a whole bunch of developers in. And so if you're interested in helping me write build APIs you won't hate too, um, swing, just talk to me on Twitter or, or anywhere. Um, and we can talk about it. So I'm going to give different chapters to different people, and then I'm just going to act as an editor instead of manually writing everything myself. Yeah, governing API books. Yeah, <laughs> API exactly. <laughs> awesome. See you in 10 minutes. So I stop Great. the broadcast, and we, we can go all in a break, and we talk to each other in 10 minutes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes, uh, folks, for the, the panel about API specifications.